Hey, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us today for IWF's book club. Um, I, we've got a great crowd. I see a lot of people have already joined um, joined in. And we're going to be here to, we're, we're having a discussion today about cynical theories, how activist scholarship made everything about race, gender, and identity. Um, this is a great book by Helen Pluckrose and James Lindsay. And Helen's going to be joining us in just a few minutes. I'm just introduce myself. I'm Kiri Lucas. I'm president of Independent Women's Forum, and I'm joined today by my colleague Charlotte Hayes. Thanks, Charlotte. Thanks for doing this with me. Um, so for the next hour, we're going to be discussing this really terrific book, and we'll have a chance to talk with Helen um, about the topics covered in this book. Most centrally, the roots and evolution of postmodernism um, and social justice, which today we see shaping the world around us. It's just about everywhere um, with the use of critical race theory, the spread of diversity, equity, and inclusion mandates, and the ascent of cancel culture. So before we invite Helen to join us up on stage, I want to go through a little bit on the technical stuff, on how we're going to have you um, participate. We really hope that you'll ask a question, join the chat room, um, or even volunteer to join us up on video and come on stage in a little bit. So you'll see we have a chat room. Um, on the right side of your screen where you can join the discussion with other attendees and my IWF teammates. Um, everybody from IWF has a T next to their name. Um, now, if you don't see the chat room, um, you can select the arrow at the top right corner to open that chat room. Now, next to the chat room tab, there is a questions tab. And that is where we're hoping that if you have a question for Helen or something you want us to discuss, please post it. And then if you go to post your question, you might see um, questions you like. You can hit an up arrow and that bumps that question up so I'll know to prioritize that to prioritize that question and know that people are really interested. Um, also know that towards the end of our time with Helen today, we'll be doing a drawing and announcing names of three people who are gonna win copies of, um, signed copies of the book. Uh, so but you have to be here at the end, so please stick around. Um, and then the books will be mailed to um, to our winners. Uh, so I think we should be all set for the technical um, the technical aspects of this. Um, so Charlotte, I think um, we are ready for you uh, to introduce Helen and for us to bring Helen up on stage. Thank you so much, Carrie. With the technical stuff out of the way, uh, we would have a great opportunity to hear from one of the most important writers writing today. This is an enormously important book. And I have to say, Helen and James have accomplished something I would have thought impossible, which is they've written a book about postmodernism that's an absolute page turner. I just loved reading it. Helen lives in the UK. She is editor of a very iconoclastic magazine called Aereo. And when she's not studying postmodernism, Helen is fiendishly interested in brewing the proper cup of English tea, her national drink. Helen, welcome, and we're so happy to have you. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. And I was just so delighted when you all greeted me with a proper cup of English tea. Yes. <laughs> I, I feel my life's mission has been served. <laughs> Um, Helen, with all that's going on today, this is the perfect time to talk to you. Um, I think a lot of people, critical theory or cynical theory, as you cynically call it, critical theory is just coming onto their radar. We're hearing about CRT, critical theory, uh, critical race theory based courses and training and abolishing racism. And I think our first uh, reaction to that is, oh, wow, that's great. Let's let's get rid of racism. Let's be less prejudiced. Let's not discriminate. But that's not really what it's about, uh, I gather from your book. It's really about power structures and uh, and it's really about a rejection of modernism. So I hope you can can tell that's a long way to say what's critical theory <laughs> well yeah critical race theory is the one that people are, are most uh, are seeing most of at the moment and and you're right Charlotte when you say it's not simply an opposition to racism it's a very specific approach so if you look at the the sort of primer to critical race theory it begins by explaining very clearly that it's opposed to um liberalism it's opposed to the civil rights um uh, discourse um of, obviously uh, which um, obviously is most associated with the work of uh, martin luther king and it's um against equality under the law so it uh, people i think misunderstand critical race theory as 
um, a quite liberal thing. And this leads a lot of people who really are liberal, who really just want everybody to stop evaluating anybody by the colour of their skin because it's stupid and unethical, to think that it's something they should support when in, in fact it's um, reinscribing a problem in a, in a different way. I, it's going to make things worse. And I think, you know, we see that more in the US than we do over here. We see the problems already. Helen, could you say it perpetuates racism, critical race theory? I, I think it makes people, whereas liberalism wanted to take the significance out of race, it, you know, your, your race might be important to you being a black woman or something could be very central to your sense of who you are, but it shouldn't make anybody else consider you to have any particular role in society. So liberalism wanted to take social significance out. The critical race approach, the critical social justice approach more generally wants to put it back in. It wants us to notice race, gender, sexuality, ability, weight, all these different um, identity markers all the time and to think about power dynamics which are assumed to be there all the time. And I, I think that yes, it's very difficult to do this and not um, become more um, some understand more difference than really actually exists between human beings. You know, I, mean, I felt like, um, Helen, one thing I really loved about your book was giving us kind of a language for some of this, um, because I do think that, um, you know, first of all, we all know today there's almost an obsession with language and making sure that everybody's got um, the, uses the proper term for anything, any, any, um, uh, for everything, and saying the wrong term can get you in, in big trouble. Um, but on this, uh, in this context, I thought that, that kind of breaking down what it is we talk about, you just mentioned the word, word liberalism, and I feel like a lot of um, folks, if they haven't read your book yet, they might not know what you mean by that, and not know kind of the, di the dichotomy that we're talking about, um, and assume that this is kind of the same old you know, elephants on one side, donkeys on the other, but we're, we're not talking about that anymore. This is about liberalism on one side and these this big social justice theory on the other. Can you kind of just, just um, break that down, talk about these terms and what how different they are, some of those core differences? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you raised that. Usually um, when I'm, I'm talking to American um, audiences, I, I remember to, to mention that when I, I speak of liberalism, I'm talking of a philosophical belief in freedom of belief, freedom of speech, um, the individual and um, their equal opportunities, um, you know, where, you know, the uh, right to pursuit to life um, and happiness. <laughs> that, that is a liberal principle, a liberal democracy. It doesn't mean people on the left, which I think sometimes in the US it is um, understood to mean. So um, conservatives um, can be liberals but if they believe in freedom of belief and speech and they believe that everyone should have equality under the law. So that that is what I'm talking about with liberalism, that movement that sort of gradually evolved over the last 200 years um, to become culturally dominant. So we have people like John Stuart Mill, uh, Mary, Mary Wollstonecraft and, and thinkers like that. But liberalism is generally this, this attitude of universalism. We are all human beings. Um, we all share a common um, humanity and we're all individuals and we should all be able to access everything. So it encourages humanism, it encourages empathy, it encourages individual liberty. So that doesn't belong to any political um, side. So we get illiberal people on the right who um, want to ban um, things like um, homosexuality or um, flag burning or, or any freedom of blasphemy, you know, that any kind of freedom of speech that criticizes religion. And you get illiberal people on the left who want to um, make everybody have a certain understanding of race and gender and speak in certain ways and not speak in other ways. And so liberals who may be on the left or the right or the center um, uh, should really be united in pushing back at this, um, ideally on their own side. Now, I, I lean quite strongly left like economically. So I focus much more on the, Ill the illiberal people on my side which is the critical social justice activists. Helen, um, 
there seems to be a well a, an unholy alliance between cancel culture and CRT, um, yeah. and, and it seems to me there's some way in which our, our very freedoms, particularly freedom of speech, are imperiled by this. Is that right? Yeah, I, I think if you understand the world as the critical social justice theorists and activists do as constructed in language there are these systems of power that are perpetuated by the way we talk about things by discourses like white supremacy patriarchy um, so transphobia and if they really believe that these systems underlie everything and are constantly oppressing people at all times then it becomes a moral imperative to stop people from saying certain things and to make them say other things so this is where the idea of cancel culture comes in now if we look at um, in my country JK Rowling um, recently she's been on the receiving end of so much abuse simply for saying that she thinks women women is a biological category and women need the word to talk about their realities this is a gender critical position and it's quite a, a moderate one she certainly should have the right to express it even if you disagree with it and she has received huge amounts of abuse now you can't cancel jk rowling because more people care about harry potter than they do about um, politics to be honest but really the amount of abuse that she's had the attempt to silence her to invalidate her to vilify her and, and make her a person who shouldn't be listened to by anyone uh, really demonstrates the idea of discourses she has said that trans people um, are not women in their mind she didn't actually say that she said something she said that there is a name for um, people who menstruate, isn't it women or something? So that the response to that, and by a lot of the actors in the Harry Potter films, which was very disappointing, was the repeating of the mantra, trans women are women, trans women are women, trans women are women. And you can see the focus on language there. They want to get that discourse out there because they believe that language really controls reality. So if you say the right things often enough, social reality will change and social justice will improve. You know, um, Helen, as you're talking about this, um, one thing I found that I don't know that I had really understood or fully like, conceptualized before reading your book was this the kind of uh, the, the assault on um, the concept of evidence and kind of the scientific method and this idea of um, falsifiability, which is, um, you kind of describe it in the book as this tremendous strength of the liberal system in which we never assume that a debate is fully settled. And you use the, um, the Newton's, um, Newton's laws, uh, that they were continually being tested and refined until Einstein came along. But that really, this is um, the, the critical race theory is kind of um, on the opposite edge of this and doesn't really tries to shut down those conversations. Can you talk a little bit about that? and? and why this is so important? Yeah, so, so many of these theories owe a great deal to the thought of Michel Foucault. He is the most cited scholar ever. He's still being cited regularly by the social justice activists of today. And one of his main contributions was the concept of biopower. A biopower is the belief that scientific discourses, scientific ways of looking at the world and explaining things are in fact oppressive. Now, he had a certain point here because for a while homosexuality was treated as a disorder. Um, mental illness um, was defined as, um, you know, it, the, the definitions of it have, have changed with culture. So. You know, they're not the first people to notice that culture affects how we look at things but there's this idea that science is as the greatest and most reliable producer of knowledge is the strongest oppressive force that really needs to be pushed back against and this comes out most strongly in queer theory um, which underlies a lot of the gender activism and trans activism that we hear and we see it a lot in um, disability studies and fat studies as well that that's um, particularly strong force there and you will hear it argued um, that the you know any uh, belief that it is better if all one 
body parts work properly or uh, to attempt to to cure any kind of um, impairment is actually akin to genocide of disabled people it's um it, it goes to ridiculous extremes that I, I think even Foucault himself would not uh, agree with Helen could I ask you something in CRT could it be possible for a white person or a cisgender straight person to be the oppressed rather than the oppressor? Um, so when we're, if, okay, so we're looking at sort of quite a complex band of theories here. They would say in principle, um, it, it could be possible for white people to be oppressed, but in reality it isn't because power systems have gone the other way. But at the moment, there are two main approaches to critical race theory, and one of them is um, Robin D'Angelo, and one of them is Ibram X. Kendi. So according to Robin D'Angelo, all white people are racist. They just can't help it. They've been socialized into it by being born into a white supremacist society. It simply isn't possible for black people to be racist. Ibram X. Kendi takes a slightly different approach where he believes more in the individual. I had some hopes of Ibram X. Kendi for a while, but I'm, I'm afraid I've lost them now. Uh, so he believes that um, uh, white people can be racist or anti-racist and black people can be racist and anti-racist. He speaks about a time in which he believed that um, white people weren't actually human and he speaks about how he regrets that um, belief and that it was essentially racist. So there's that, there's an element in there in which you can see as, as some humanism, some individualism. And I would love to see um, Ibram X. Kendi develop this idea more, but unfortunately he seems to have rushed in the opposite direction and, um, and declared that any kind of disparity um, uh, proves uh, racism to exist and any action that evens things up, even if it is um, racially discriminatory, is anti-racist. So. Um, Sorry, that's a rather long um, answer to your question, but um, according to D'Angelo, uh, no, white people can't be victims of racism. According to Kendi, yes, they they could be, but um, that's they're not <laughs> in practice. <laughs> well, you know, um, we have some great questions coming from the audience, and I want get, to get one in here that I think is really relevant. Carol Dona um, wrote um, early on in this discussion, um, with with the cancel culture, hasn't critical race theory become another authoritarian culture dynamic, similar to the culture dynamics that is that it is being critical of? And so, um, I, I think it's a really interesting way um, to frame it. We'd love to hear what you have to say. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a, a very valid um, observation, and I I think more people have started to to notice this and to see it in this way. Um, one piece I I wrote about this was is called the two great lies of um, critical social justice, and that that is one of them. The idea that um, critical race theorists are a radical grassroots movement pushing back at a dominant discourse that is racist simply isn't credible in light of the evidence that actually um, critical social justice is the dominant discourse which is imposing authoritarian measures on the general population when the universities the government the uh, the media and general society is on your side. It's likely that you are a dominant discourse. If you're forcing people to do things and believe and say things they don't believe, then uh, by the the whole sort of ethics of dismantling power systems, they are one that needs to be dismantled. Helen, we're getting great questions, and you'll be pleased to know that a lot of our questions indicate they've read your book. But I'm going to yeah. go with my first one from a more general question from Lee H. What can parents do, especially if our school board is very on board or starting to be on board with this? Can we address this with the board, or what are our next steps? I heard courts will need to be involved. What can we do? Help. Okay, that, that's a very good question. It's a very complex question. I would invite this individual, if um, they're speaking about their own situation, to go to counterweightsupport.com and click on the Get Help um, section where we will take your details, find out where you are, what state you're in, 
what laws there are, what organisations there are to support you. So there are ways and there are groups that are, are pushing back. It depends where you are on what we can actually do. But as uh, on the level of ideas, I think how you should speak to your children about this, I, I think that it's it's imperative to 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 instill liberal values in them to um to impress upon them that evaluating people's worth by their skin color is is simply unethical it, it's it's stupid and it's it's unethical no matter which way it goes um that doesn't mean that um you know power has been distributed equally among the races in american history or british history but the children understand a general sense of fairness and reciprocity if you can teach them early on you know don't treat people the way you wouldn't want to be treated and try to instill these liberal values in them i think they'll be more inoculated against the critical social justice approach i think a problem is that so many of us have just assumed liberal values for so long we we haven't um remembered how to argue for them or how to pass them on you know, um helen I, I, that's really um i think it's helpful and i do think that there's a sense of almost like helplessness with some people as they see this mm -hmm. spreading everywhere around them and feel um you know especially as you discussed um this idea that almost by any time you try to push back on it especially if you are a white person or um are high up on the, the privilege matrix or whatever, that it feels um, that it's very, uh, there's, the stakes are high. There's a lot of people who are really worried about it. I'm, I'm curious, I feel like, um, you know, the Independent Women's Forum is um, is uh, conservative, libertarians um, on the, for the most part, um, right of center. Um, and I feel like there's a lot of people on our side who are shaking their heads and saying yes, and feel very personally um, attacked by this. And it, like, like, we have a lot at stake um, as a movement, as well as individuals. Um, but what has your reception? It you know it, it heartens me when I ever I hear that somebody on the left, I assume somebody we may you and I may disagree about tax policy, but when we <laughs> agree about, about this, it's we've got so much to build on and really to join together in this fight. Do you mm -hmm. feel like there's hope? Uh, is there are there people on the? Um, do you feel like there are people waking up to this? Because I feel like a lot of us see it just spreading, um, and are worried about the the lack of pushback. Um, so I'm curious if you've been encouraged or discouraged. I, I think that the perception of the section of the left which embraces critical social justice ideas is much larger than it actually is. So there's often a misunderstanding on the part of conservatives um, who will relate uh, Marxism to critical social justice when actually the Marxists have been uh, critical of postmodernism um, from the start, you can criticize Marxists on other grounds, and, and I do, I'm, I'm not a Marxist, but um, they're, they're, they're uh, one of the strongest opponents. Uh, liberals like me are also, I believe, bec we've, we've been too tolerant because of the respect for viewpoint diversity and because of the supposed good intentions. I think liberal leftists have allowed this to develop um much more than they should have done but i'm i'm seeing a pushback now and i was i was talking to um an african american conservative woman yes uh, yesterday i think um who was and, and we were finding ourselves in absolute agreement about um uh, you know whether her child should be expected to stand up and um identify his areas of privilege and his areas of oppression and um, whether it was anybody else's business so i i think that liberal conservatives and liberal leftists have got a lot of shared ground here and we can push back at this together but i think the left will uh, in the uk i'm i'm more confident that this is going to happen more quickly we've got a stronger old left um which has uh, remained quite steady I, I think it could take longer in in the U, the US. I'm 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 quite worried about you you lot at the moment, but I think the um, 
I, I think the left, a liberal left, will reassert itself because it works. People won't support um, this blatant illiberalism uh, for long, and, and the anti-scientific views simply um, don't work. You know, children will start dying, and there, there, science works, uh, liberalism works. So it's going to reassert itself at some point, but we're in a crisis at the moment. Um, I'm having a hard time finding questions because they're all so good, but I'm going to go for another practical one. Uh, sort of, I, I'm, I'm like Ann Landers, I want you to give practical advice. This is from William Higgins. Um, it's several places in the book, it is argued that postmodernism and core knowledge and political principles are like a religion. Uh, how about that? Mm. Actually, I didn't get the practical one, but this is pretty intriguing too. Yeah. So I, I think. Um, when we, we we've we've spoken about that, I think it was about three years ago. We we did a, a talk called Inter "Is Intersectionality a Religion?" And um, we the answer we concluded no, not explicitly, but it it serves a great number of the same social and psychological needs that religion does. So it provides a framework of good and evil, a simple way to understand the world, a community, um, ritual, a lot of those same um, needs. Now, a lot of religious people get very cross with me when I say this, and they often point out things um, like uh, there's no redemption, there's no forgiveness or grace as there is in Christianity. So I'm not trying to insult religious people here when I'm... Um, although I, I myself am not um, either religious or a fan of religion, but I'm not being um, insulting of religion at the moment when I say that I think critical social justice serves a lot of the same social needs and psychological needs that religion does. Um, Helen, we've got a question from um, the IWF's chairman, um, Heather Higgins, and who was a big fan of your book and was the one who originally um, encouraged me to read it because she thought it was just so important. And sure, her first question was, how does criti critical race theory see power structures in non-white countries? How do they address or acknowledge tribal power divisions within the races? Well, they would generally say then it wasn't their business to do so. They would say it was the business of the country itself to do so. So we see some people, I was pleasantly surprised by uh, Isabel Wilkerson's um, cast recently because that um, was touted on Twitter as comparing um, America to Nazi Germany, which I, so I expected it to be awful. But she does look at um, systems of power and privilege as they existed in India, in caste systems where brown people are oppressing brown people, in um, Nazi Germany when white Nazis were murdering white Jews, and in um, slavery and Jim Crow America. So. It, there's there's a certain amount of that there are some people who will look at things this way but generally if you speak to an activist and you say what about other countries they will tell you we are focused on western um situations and white dominated culture we let we don't have any right to judge any other culture Well, thanks for, thanks for that. And I'm going to follow up with one more question, which is a, a little bit on the same lines. Also, um, um, Heather, but I think this is, there's a lot of people who are, are interested in this topic, especially this was a, there was a big debate in, the, um, in Congress yesterday over um, the Equality Act. Um, and this has to do with, um, uh, with transgender and the fairness of, uh, fair treatment of transgender, but then also kind of undermining this idea. It's predicated, it's really, it's not written just to prevent discrimination and what we would all I think recognize as unfair and unjust um, discrimination, um, but instead it basically tries to wipe out this concept of sex differences, that there can be any category where women, we recognize women as distinct physical human beings with, some, with different um, physical vulnerabilities than men. Um, so Heather asks, how do um, social justice believers square obliterating biological sex differences while elevating biological and superficial race differences? Mm. They, they theorize this, this quite differently, and, and that's one of the very interesting things. So when we've got the, the queer theory idea, which um, really wants to break down all boundaries and categories, 
um, that is what is underlying a lot of the trans activism where you cannot make um, reasonable arguments that trans people need to be treated with dignity and respect but they trans women cannot be straightforwardly accepted as women in every situation for the sake of women's safety in sports for example um, you can't make these arguments because this will be then accused of biological essentialism and an oppressive bio-narrative. The uh, race idea, that comes from a different stream. And so that is much less um, sort of postmodern and post-structuralist in that sense. And it works much more on identity politics. So then we have people divided into categories. So we'll hear someone like Kimberly Crenshaw say, um, we rather than saying I am a person who happens to be black, black people should say I am black and really foreground that identity. So they want to chop people up into categories. What we get with trans activism is this really strange mixture of the queer theory breaking down of categories with the intersectional identity politics and it, it causes a, a totally incoherent mess. So uh, you ask, how do they try to square it? They don't. I don't know if you know of um, Rebecca Tuval, uh, who wrote a paper and she argued for transracialism in which she applied the rules of from queer theory for transgender individuals to race. And she was accused of doing violence with her words um, to racial minorities and to trans people. Her paper was retracted. The uh, journal wrote an apology. They accused her of all kinds of terrible things. She had death threats. So um, yeah, they, they don't try to square this. This is a, an incoherence that, that really doesn't work. And then we're going to see a big battle, I think, between um, trans issues and race issues um, this probably this year because they've been narrowing down identity categories for quite a while now and these are the two big ones that are, are left and I, I, I think um, I think race is going to, to win out as the dominant um, structure to read the world through <laughs> and thank you Heather for being so kind about my book <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think I will go back to a practical question. This is from David Noyes, and he says, Akrina Khoury, he says, what can we do to combat the mob if they come for us? I'm just a teacher. It is, it is, is it possible for me to not, not be cancelled? Second, CRT has come into the school as equity in the center, in the center training. Um, is it required to participate? How do I speak up and yet not be cancelled uh, and or fired? Um, Okay, so this is um, a much more complex question than I can I can answer. I, I'll give a sum a summary, but um, have a look at um, uh, it, I think it's on new discourses how to speak to your employer about anti racism. That's one that that we've written in which the way to approach this, and um, we have our own method as well at, at Counterweight, which we call the Counterweight method, <laughs> and you've got to both be both knowledgeable and principled so you go in with knowledge of the um, system that you're criticizing and with strong principles that oppose racism so you can address the issue by saying I too think that we need policies that are opposed to any kind of racial discrimination I am concerned about this approach uh, for knowledgeable reasons. So you, you can say, for example, that critical race theory simply isn't compatible with the worldviews of many people. It isn't compatible because it believes, for example, in socialization to such a, a strong extent, it doesn't allow for the possibility of free will. Um, it doesn't allow for individual agency. Now, this goes against the liberal belief in the marketplace of ideas, the conservative belief in personal responsibility, and the belief of Abrahamic um, of the Abrahamic faiths in God-given free will. So, you can argue that this is a single approach, and that there is a need for a more inclusive approach 
that doesn't center on one particular theory. And a particularly good way to do this is to point out that critical race theory or other theories in this field are very much Western um, phenomenon. And they may not be suitable to people who aren't um, Western. They come from postmodern ideas, which is atheistic ideas in 19th century Germany and atheistic ideas in 20th century France. They're, this is not going to be suitable for everybody with every, every sort of cultural belief. And if you can come at it from that angle, it works very well. So we, for example, have had our quickest results when the person objecting to this has come from, say, a black Muslim background. If they say, um, we had a man, um, he wasn't actually a Muslim, I don't think, he was an American man, he was a black Hispanic American man, and he said, this is not compatible with my worldview. I don't want to hear you talking about white privilege. It is demeaning to me and my cultural values and his workplace immediately stopped. Generally, we don't get results that fast. People have to be patient and persistent. They have to ask questions. They have to sort of um, persistently pursue the problem in a cooperative way. Assume that your employer or your school or whatever wants to do the right thing and that you are trying to help them to do that better than they are already doing it. <laughs> You know, Helen, um, I really I appreciate that. And I think um, it's it's interesting. Another thing that was um, kind of new for me in reading your book is um, in thinking about who all is harmed by this and what the stakes are. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of uh, the questions we are getting are revolving around people who are worried um, and are worried about speaking up because of the fear of retribution. Um, but um, which is an obvious and I think tremendously important and impactful like harm that we all are confronting. But I also mm -hmm. thought it was really interesting in your book how you describe Kind of the harms to um, to the psyche, especially of kids and young people, but really all of us. And you described it. I thought this was really helpful in um, as like the opposite of cognitive um, therapy. Of um, in, instead of learning to put a trauma in context and learning tools for getting over it, this is instead almost trying to make that trauma or the the bad things that have happened to you the centerpiece of your life or your oppression as um, the opposite of that. Can you talk a little bit about this? Like, who do you think? Who are the groups that are being most harmed by this and kind of what are the, the stakes for the country and for the, the world? The, the, it's, I know it's not just the US. Yeah, no, well, that, that part of the book that you're referencing there is where I was um, discussing Greg Lukianoff and John Heights, The Coddling of the American Mind. They look at this very um, specifically. Since writing Cynical Theories, I've actually um, become a lot more knowledgeable about um, the impact that this is having on people's psychology now. We are hearing, um, again, when I say we, I'm always referring to Counterweight, my organization. We're hearing repeatedly from psychologists, from psychiatrists, from therapists, counselors, social workers, that this is having a serious impact on their practice and on the mental health of individuals. But yes, the, the, what, what you were talking about just there, psychologists talk about schemas, the way that we see the world in order to make sense of things, we create patterns and systems that we see the world through to make them work. Now, sometimes people can develop negative schemas, which leads them to always interpret um, things in a negative way. If I was to say to you, your hair looks nice, you might think, does my hair usually look terrible? So that, you know, that would be a negative schema that you had and a, a cognitive behavioral therapist would then work on that with you so that you started to see that it was actually just a comment, a compliment, you know, it wasn't, it, you're seeing it through a negative schema. I think that, yes, what a lot of these theories do is they teach people to view the world through these systems of power and privilege and then um, create a negative schema, which then is confirmed by the way they read the world. And it causes people to become afraid of the world. I think obviously racial minorities are particularly um, vulnerable here if they are going to be led to believe that everybody is against them at all times and they have no um, hope of getting a fair shake at, at anything. But I've focused myself, because I, I was a liberal feminist so long, on um, the disempowering um, effect this has on women. 
if we are led to believe that we are not taken seriously because we are women, um, that we need men to amplify our voices because everybody thinks that we are stupid and we don't know anything and we need everything explained to us and that um, you know all men are dangerous and uh, just objectify women. It, it It's going to lead to a very hostile perception of the world which isn't realistic and it worries me as the mother of a 16 year old girl um, what this will actually accomplish for women going into the workplace, how confident um, they can feel that they can actually achieve things if there are these theories which are telling them that they can't. I, I get particularly cross when there's somebody, a male feminist on Twitter or something with 20 followers telling me that he needs to be quiet so I can be heard. And I... Um, I haven't I haven't found um, myself that uh, people tend to believe me less because I'm I'm a woman and I'm I, I am particularly concerned about how this will uh, affect women. I'm concerned how this will affect racial minorities. I've I've spoke, been speaking recently to a mother of a biracial child who is um, telling me how badly he has been affected uh, by this, and I'm also quite concerned about trans people because the vast majority of trans people don't actually politicize their identity. They don't really even want to tell people that they are trans or draw attention to this fact. But trans activism is causing so much hostility towards trans people that I, I think it's setting back um, acceptance of their right to sort of go about their business normally in a society. Yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting. I very much agree with you. I know we have, um, um, we're going to be bringing on, somebody wants to ask a question, I believe Elizabeth is going to pop up in video and ask a question herself. Okay. We can make that happen. Let's see if we can. Otherwise, we've got a lot of great questions coming, um, coming in if we're having any trouble with that one. Let's see. There we go. Can you guys see me? Yes. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. Um, I just, yeah. Thank you. Okay. I just want to say, um, in your foreword, you talk about how your daughter never wants to hear you talk about postmodernism again. That's my family with me after reading this book. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my little brother's right there. Oh my gosh. So I, I guess I have a couple things that relate to my question. Right <laughs> mm. Um. So first, I just want to say that, like back when we were in school, I had a friend who was very different from my political views. She's um, like a lesbian radical feminist, and I disagree with her on a lot of things about like social policy and the economy, but we actually, I found that we have like common ground in our opinions on queer theory, and mm -hmm. I'm actually really good friends with her, and I thought that was interesting for like finding common ground. So my next thing is that I'm from a rather progressive area, and my school has a program um, that's like sort of like sensitivity training like this, and I do think that our um, teachers and our administration are well-meaning. You talked about this in your book, how people are well-meaning, but they often don't know what they're getting themselves into, I guess. And so um, what I found with our program is that some of the stuff that we have to read is very much critical race theory. But and at first, I was really opposed to it. But actually, re we had to read Just Mercy, and it really changed my view on race in the United States. And I thought it was a really great book. But see, like obviously, that's different from other things like unpacking the invisible knapsack of white privilege. And so um, that's something that I've noticed for our thing. And the thing is, is that I feel like that for students who are already on the far right and students on the far left, I feel like it's just gonna polarize them because students on the far right are just gonna be like, oh, see, this is proof that the administration doesn't support my ideas and censorship. And then my friends on the left are just gonna um, not be exposed to any viewpoints, I guess. And so the third thing I wanted to say, and this is gonna finally lead to my question, is that I get that there's a lot of parents here and um, I do high school Lincoln Douglas circuit debate. And um, this is actually a thing that if you have a kid that wants to do debate, just be warned that circuit debate, especially for policy and Lincoln Douglas, um, these ideas um, like Baudrillard, like Judith Butler, like these authors actually get read a lot. Like you'll see high schoolers reading them. So it's um, really not welcoming for people of diverse viewpoints. And I would say your best bet is probably sticking with public forum if you have a child interested in debate. So my question is like, 
how do you engage with these ideas? Because I find that coaches often assume that like when they're teaching stuff like this, like critiques um, yeah. queer theory about critical race theory, that students are going in with very leftist um, assumptions as to how the world functions. And I guess like, and your book was great because it was really made for someone who like doesn't understand, like who doesn't go in with these assumptions. And it really explains it a lot to me, which I'm really grateful for because it like, explains in a more cogent way stuff that I've thought for a long time about critical race theory and things like that, that like I could never say to my debate coaches or to my friends. So I'm really grateful that you did this and it's stuff that I've actually been thinking about for a lot. So do you have any advice for like engaging with like these arguments or how to sound convincing like you believe them? Or, like how to yeah. go into the literature? Yeah, so uh, again, we, we have and um, um, going to be publishing um, soon a list of talking points, a way of um, bringing up um, issues in a sort of non-confrontational way, but that will make people think. So if you're in a situation in which um, somebody is saying, is, is claiming that critical race theory represents the views of, of black people, and that we need to listen to people of colour, then you can ask the question how do we do this uh, while making sure that we don't stereotype people of color into one uh, monolithic group how can we respect the intellectual diversity of say black americans um, asking questions like this is a way to to kind of open it up without um going straight in for the attack so we 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 recommend a sort of variety of approaches and and if you believe that the, the other person is generally well intentioned then it is always best to act as though you think they are and to ask them questions about how their approach is actually going to make things better for marginalized people is there a chance instead that it could stereotype that it could divide that it could um, put people into boxes which um, disadvantage them shut down communication set back progress and to try and open up the discussion in that way it dep off, depends very much what it is that you want to to discuss and this is why it's so difficult because it's so complicated you i i get a letter from somebody and they have a specific issue and then i can help them think through how to address this particular issue but um having a generic approach is is really quite difficult to sort of get across in a in a short period of time essentially i would just say ask ask questions and challenge gently uh, unless you're actually being attacked by somebody who clearly knows all about this theory has totally bought into it then you can get a bit firmer and you can say well let's look at the evidence of how this actually works does diversity training reduce racism there are some studies now that are indicating that it increases it does unconscious bias training actually work there are numerous studies which shows that it doesn't do what it's um, alleged to do by unconscious bias trainers and that it it doesn't even give the same results on the same day with the same person so there are there is arm yourself with knowledge know what level of problem you're dealing with whether you're talking to somebody who is low knowledge and is just trying to do the right thing in which case you can probably sway them um, or if you're dealing with someone who really is a hardcore zealot in which case you're, you're going to have to um, argue with them quite strongly using a lot of evidence using a lot of very um, well thought out principles and hope to influence anyone else who is listening to the conversation rather than them. Helen, th thank you so much for this. And I know we're going to be, um, we're getting close to, to um, wrapping up and not too long. Um, so, and everybody stand by, we're going to be doing our book drawing and um, announcing winners in just a second. Um, and I, Helen, I feel like we've already kept you longer than we had promised, but I have one more question mm -hmm. um, that I want to, um, to um, to, to put out there and to get your reaction to. And there's actually a number of questions that are kind of along these lines, but Whitney Van Vactor has written, one of the beautiful beauties of our country is that people of different ethnicities marries and have children. How does C CRT reconcile that fact? For example, in schools, are biracial students forced to choose a specific identity and taught to hate one of their parents? Um, and I do, it's interesting because we've heard some references to this, this 
this idea that one of the things that's almost ironic, um, but maybe not, maybe this is part of what's cynical about it, is we have made a whole lot of progress um, in kind of moving beyond race in our personal lives and people being, um, there being so much more interaction among among different different groups that now uh, a critical race theory seeks to divide us. Do you have kind of a reaction to that and um, and you know how you see this interplay? I I think yeah we we see a problem where progress hasn't um, been recognised and that that is very central to critical race theory. The argument and De Derek Bell is the one most known for this is that that racism hasn't actually improved at all. Uh, racist attitudes haven't decreased. They've just gone underground. They've become more subtle. They're they're harder to get at. And so we will often hear that um, just because you have a uh, a black husband or a mixed race child or um, close friends of a, of a different race doesn't mean that you don't have white supremacist views. And I I think this is is clearly nonsense. It's quite there's an awful lot of evidence to suggest that the best way to overcome any racist bias somebody might have is to get people together with shared goals to actually get to know people it's very it's difficult to sustain a belief that somebody is intellectually and morally inferior to you if you're actually spending time with them so an interesting study that that i i found particularly good and I, i'm afraid i can't pronounce um his surname because it, it's polish and it has about 12 syllables uh but it's um uh, it was a look at um how we classify sex and race in our brains when we're working on shared projects now the hypothesis was that if a group is working towards a shared pro project it will always retain a sense of what sex members of the group are because we're a sexually reproducing species it has been useful for us to develop cognitive mechanisms to recognize what sex other people are. There haven't been races for very long and there haven't been races in conflict for very long. So there are no such cognitive mechanisms. Racism really is a social construct. And this is what these studies show time and time again. If you get a group of racially diverse people with a shared project, they very quickly forget about race it becomes irrelevant and they they get on with things and they relate to each other so i don't think i wouldn't advocate a simplistic um we've already achieved a perfect post-racial society and then critical race theory came along and made it all bad again because you know we hadn't racism there was there was still work to do there is still work to do but critical race theory is not helping what has helped is liberalism is yeah. consistently frowning upon evaluating people by their race and continuing to do so and this this is how racism will die identity politics is is how it will stay alive well thank you so much i feel like that's a really a great place to kind of um start or to to stop but this is not a conversation that should stop and we really want everybody to stay connected with this um, before we kind of talk a little bit about that and um, and thank Helen for her time, I first want to just announce our um, the winners of the book raffle, and that's Nancy Fallon, Janice Gray, and Erin Earhart. Um, you'll be receiving copies of um, of um, Helen's signed book. Um, but Helen, I now want to um, give a chance both. Um, I want to thank you and Charlotte. I want to give you a chance to also thank Helen. Oh, it was a riveting discussion, and I want to thank Helen and all the other people who had fabulous questions. Helen, it is a great book. It was a riveting discussion, and uh, I thank you all for being with us. Oh, thank you very much for having me on. It's been lovely talking to you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks. Thank you, Helen. Um, and everybody who's um, who's um, still with us, I want to thank you and tell you a little bit more about what's coming up with IWF, um, and especially with our author chats, please be sure to sign up. We have one coming up with Ayan Hershey Ali, um, and that's soon in April. I'm just missing where, um, in my notes here, where um, the exact date, but we'll be, come to IWF.org, um, we will find, um, you can sign up, and um, and I believe this is also going to be, this is, people are asking in the questions if this is recorded, um, and I'm pretty sure it is, and we're, you can access it. Um, I do think this is such an important conversation. A few things just to know about IWF. Um, you know, we are an organization that is uh, committed to, um, to hosting things like this, having thoughtful conversations about the most important issues of the day, 
We believe all issues are women's issues and we want to advance policies that aren't just well intended, but that actually improve women's lives. So please be sure to, if this is your first time um, interacting with us, please be sure to follow up and sign up again um, so that we can um, have you back. So I think that's about, um, about it. If you do have other questions, um, you know, we will be, um, please you can, uh, you can subscribe to us and stay, you know, stay in touch and we'll be doing this again. So thank you for joining us. And especially be sure to sign our free speech pledge. I think people are, um, are linking that and sharing that because this is really one of the core issues is about the ability to have conversations like this rest on free speech. So thank you all for joining us today. And Charlotte, thanks for doing this with me. It was a great pleasure.